Hey guys, I wanted to make a video to talk about the current state of the hobby, of trading cards, of sports memorabilia. So you might ask, you know, what, what do I personally know about it? What are my qualifications? Um, I've been in trading cards for quite a while. I've done three nationals. I've done several bigger shows, most of them in Chicago um, and St. Louis you know, the Midwest, uh, Minneapolis, those places. So bigger cities, I've done, you know, I don't know, 50 shows in bigger cities. And I've done a ton of little shows. I try to do, you know, I was trying to do one or two a month up until, you know, last year when everything shut down. But so I'm going to compare, since I did a card show a couple days ago, this past weekend, um, a smaller show, but it, it was in Des Moines. You know, it's the capital of Iowa, so there's 250,000 people there. And, um, you know, people can travel up to an hour or so away to go to the show. So I, I did notice a big difference between the National, which was in the beginning of August and end of the July, end of July, August. I did notice a big difference between... And also, I will say I did a show in July, the same show I did this past weekend in Des Moines. I did that in July. So I, I could see like a peak. Being in those situations, being at those shows, there was a definite peak. And the peak was at the National. There's no doubt about it in my mind. And I, you know, you can feel that, you know, considering I sell quite a bit online on eBay and ComC, you can see that just from online sales, but also from in-person shows. So I was kind of curious to see what to expect this past weekend. I really didn't know. I knew it wouldn't probably be as busy. But say the, the one in Des Moines in July, there was a lot of people there. The, it was probably, you know, and that's not a big show. It's 60 or 70 tables. It's maybe your average a little bigger than your average local regional show. But there was probably, I would say, at least a thousand people that went through that show. Now, this show, there was probably a third of that. You know, probably 300 people went through the show this time. So it's pretty pretty much normal. Back to the way it was. So, and then in at the National, you had... I don't know what the final total was there, but there was, you could hardly walk through it. And the thing I noticed was that there were so many new collectors. They had never been to a show before. People came up to me, lots of people came up just to me, specific, you know, just a dealer there saying, I've never been to a show. I don't know my way around. I don't, this is overwhelming and all that kind of, you know they they were lost basically so if what i what i think is that a lot of those people aren't going to stay and what what those collectors were specifically buying were things that new cards new new cards that were psa graded now, they probably have no idea of supply and demand as far as sports cards go. Everybody knows that to an extent. But what is the print run on any, like, base card or things that aren't numbered? You really don't know. And we also don't know how much more have manufacturers produced now that all these new people came in. And now we have a flood of new people, but a lot of those people are going to leave. And now all these, they're going to mass produce things or they're just going to make more inserts and that kind of thing. So, you know, this does periodically happen in the hobby. There, the hobby has not seen anything like this for a long time. So my expectation is things will basically go back to the way they were before the lockdowns. Now, people were locked at home. Obviously, they might have had more money that they wouldn't have had normally. They were looking for things to do. And uh, baseball cards are a great outlet for, you know, a hobby. 
So, so my expectation is that things will go back to what they were. And a lot of these new cards on, we, we've seen already. This is why I, I look, I think that what you should do is collect things you like, but also things that are going to retain value. And things that are going to retain value aren't necessarily new cards. And in actuality, I don't think they will at all, really. Um, and you can see that now a lot of things that were $10,000 or whatever, they're probably less than half of that now. So I had a person come up to me, you know, he was, he was brand new to the hobby. He's like, I don't, my brother was into it. I bought a box and I got a $5,000 card. And then after that, I was hooked. Well, of course, if you pull something like that, which, in that, you know, I don't know what the odds of are, are getting something like that in some kind of box, you're going to have to probably spend $500 for the box or whatever. I really don't know. I really don't know much of anything about new cards because what I like to do is collect vintage. Vintage, for the most part, it's going to retain its value. It's going to go up a little bit every year. And if you're looking for, I mean, I'm talking about like T206, 1952 tops, you know, 53 tops maybe up to like 56 and lower pre-war stuff. In my mind, that's the kind of thing you should be collecting, you know, Jordan and stuff to an extent. But Jordan, like his rookie cards and stuff, they got insane. And the fact is that a lot of these boxes that you see, you know, I, I was completely shocked that like a 1990 Fleer box, I don't know what they were going for, but... Those are mass, mass produced, you know, Fleer box of basketball cards. Just, I mean, there were millions and millions of those cards out there. So when I, when the lockdown happened, there were no shows and people were just buying online. Well, a lot of people, maybe old dealers had tons of that stuff sitting in their house. They just didn't know how to sell online or they weren't interested in doing that. So now when the sh shows started popping back up, you know, I, the first show I was at was in the Quad Cities <clears throat> in Iowa, and I saw these boxes everywhere, and they were like three, four hundred dollars. Well, they're not; they're worth like twenty. And uh, you know, it's it's just there's no way looking at it like a supply and demand type cycle. There's no way that that stuff was going to retain its value. So hopefully, if you guys had any of that stuff like that, you sold it and took advantage. Um, so I had a Jordan second year card that was PSA graded a seven and I paid $70 for so like a year and a half ago and then I sold it for a thousand so that was an example like I just felt like now the card is worth probably 400 maybe um I just felt like you can you can get the sense and there's other areas the stock market for example is a perfect analogy to trading cards and <clears throat> if you look at people you can get the sense of people it's called fear of missing out people see like a market exploding the stock market everything's going up all i got to do is buy well that happened during the pandemic as well so people were at home they thought they could figure out the stock market and <clears throat> you know it all you had to do was buy and everything went up and I'm going to sell, you know, but a lot of people lost a lot of money in the stock market. And then it's it, because there's the fear of missing out on the next best thing. So kind of the point of this video is I'm going to start talking about the stock market as well, which is another like passion of mine. So and I, I see these same cycles in the market that I see in trading cards. So, and you could almost look exactly like in February of this past year, February and March, there was a big dip in all those kind of stocks that are speculative, just like card market was speculative as well, speculative of, you know, PSA 10s, whatever, the latest basketball cards that have released or whatever, the same exact speculation, same exact time happened in February and March and all those things all those speculative stocks all the speculation and trading cards 
They all hit a peak at that time, and since then, they've been dropping. Now, these things kind of tend to go in waves. Maybe some of that stuff will start going back up. The stuff like, say, Jordan cards, Jordan rookie cards, specifically his rookie card, maybe not the other ones because they're not, there's just more of them. You know, his second year, I would say as well, is a good, would be a good investment. However, even at $400 for a PSA 10, that might be still overvalued. Well, time will tell on that stuff. But um, so, like I said, the, the, the point of this video is, is to start to make an analogy between trading cards and the stock market. And when you buy trading cards, yeah, you should buy what you like, but also you should buy, you should find a way to buy what you like that is going to be an investment over time. So if you're putting in a thousand dollars in trading cards, that should ideally double every seven years. Let's say that's what you know the stock market overall does. Every seven years, it doubles. So we're gonna start talking about that as well. I know I don't have a lot of subscribers, but you know what what I see, you know, and I don't want to criticize necessarily criticize people on YouTube, but what I see is when you look at the stock market and people where they get their information, they're getting it from places like YouTube or Reddit or whatever. <clears throat> but the reality is those people, they might have way more money than the average person has. If they're a YouTuber with a million subscribers or 500,000 subscribers or whatever, they, and they have a job, they have a good job, whatever, they're intelligent people. Um, and also, they're a lot of times they're pushing something else. And I don't want to push anything on anyone. I'm not trying to do that. I, I want people to realize that you can do all of this stuff on your own. Like, I, I can do trading cards, I can flip, I can do the stock market, I can have a regular job, a, a good paying job. I can I can do all those things at once. Don't limit yourself into one particular area. Find things you're good at or things you like to learn about and find a way to monetize that. So I, I that's really what I believe people should be doing. Because if you ask people, a lot of people don't like their job. You know, I don't necessarily like my job, but I don't have to be there full time so I can handle what I'm doing. Um, and we'll talk about that more later. But I just want people to realize, like, don't don't fall in this trap that you can't be successful in other areas besides having a career and a job or whatever. Don't think that you... And the thing is, it'll have people criticize you. You, If you start a business, you know, I'm going, I'm going to garage sales, finding stuff. People are going to be like, oh, you can't make any money doing that. But that's, I showed a video yesterday of all the stuff I got at a card show. I don't know how much I'm going to make on that, but it's going to be $1,000 easily. But the pro, the thing is that people don't want to put in the work, right? People don't want to put in the time to learn. But we're not, we're not thinking about that. We're going to, here we're learning as much as we can about things we're interested in. Now, this could be anything, again, you could be doing stamps or coins or whatever. But I think you should have something like that that you can monetize an interest. You can learn and monetize. And again, like maybe maybe I don't want to make money at collecting baseball cards, but I love collecting. If, I, if I'm not reselling stuff, I don't have even 10% of what I actually have here. The reason why I have what I have, if you guys follow my Instagram, I'm showing stuff that I have. That's nothing compared to what I actually have. Like I have tons of stuff and I, I probably can't possibly show it all, but I have a ton. And the reason why I have it all, have all that stuff and it's an investment is because I'm thinking like that. I'm thinking, I'm, I'm looking to make money at doing it. But I don't necessarily have to make money at it. I could use it to fund my collection if I wanted to. <clears throat> okay, so that's, we're doing that. 
And now we're going to start talking a little bit about the stock market. I, want, I don't want to get too like in the beginning. I don't want to like overwhelm people because there is a lot to learn. However, it's not quite as complicated as people want you to believe. And that's the other thing. And when I started investing in the stock market, trading in stocks, people are like, well, you're going to, it's risky. You're going to lose your money. It's risky to open a business, to start online business. It's risky to do this. It's risky to do that. <clears throat> you're going to have people telling you those things like that. And that's not, that's a terrible mentality. That's, that's a mentality that you cannot have to be as, as successful as you want to be. You cannot have that mentality. You have to have the mentality that, okay, well, look at other people, what other people are doing it. Use examples. These people are doing it that I know personally. They're doing it. They're successful at it. Is there any reason why I can't do that as well? And when I look at it, there's no reason why I personally can't do it. There's no reason why I can't. I know I can tell somebody else how to do it. And it's just a matter of believing in yourself. And it sounds cliche, I know, but you believe in yourself. You do your best to learn about it. And when you run into obstacles, you use those obstacles. Maybe you falter or whatever. Everyone does. But you use those obstacles to learn. Even if you were to start a business and failed at it, whatever you learned is worth more than what you lost trying to do that. So those are the things I, I really believe. And even with me starting a YouTube channel, like I, I know there's a lot I can say. I know there's a lot I can teach people, but do I run a channel for a year and I don't have anybody watching or do I just quit, you know, and keep going? But I, I think this is what, what everybody runs into when they're starting something. They got to believe in what they're talking about. They got to know what they're talking about. And it's just a matter of time before other people, you're going to have people that are interested in the same things you are, probably a lot of people. So it's just a matter of time before those people find you. And then, you know, you, you just grow from there. But anyways, that's what we're doing here. Started with trading cards. Going to move on to the stock market. We're talking about flipping things. We're doing all this stuff. So there's a lot of there's a lot of similarities between flipping trading cards and flipping stocks. It's basically the exact same thing. And reality is it's easier to flip stocks. But there's, a, there's some more risk there. I will say that. But you cannot listen to, you know, most of the people that are talking that you just can't because they have way more money. They're willing to take more risk and we're not, we're not necessarily doing that. We're doing this in a smart way. So if you guys follow my Instagram, my Instagram is below. I've got some stock charts in there. That's the type of stuff I'm investing in. Look at those stock charts. Some of them are, are some things that I would not invest in. And I'll say that in the description. And some of them are just big winners that I've had. So when you when people tell you that you can't do it, don't don't believe that. That's total BS. So hopefully you guys stay tuned. Keep keep watching. You know, even if you're not interested in the stock market, I think everyone should learn about it. They should learn about their personal finance because you know you need to have some knowledge of personal finance. Don't let everyone else do it for you. You got to know about it yourself. Whether you'd want to do that or not, you should know something about it. But stay tuned for that. I'm going to have a lot more baseball card stuff. So that's, there's all that stuff for you guys there too. So thanks for watching. See ya.